So let's try to make a couple of more examples uh, of this uh, functional style of programming uh, by rechecking the code we wrote before and see if we can simplify it in some way. For example, we had this, uh, the first code we wrote it was the find. So, okay. Find was uh, looking for an element into the array that had a specific property. So this can actually be rewritten like, uh, uh, so let's take the exam list and we filter it with the condition that for each exam, the exam dot co dot uh, code should be equal to the code that they receive uh, the parameter. And this returns, what does it return? An array of zero elements if uh, we don't uh, uh, find the code, or one element, basically, if uh, we find the code. So at this point, we could uh, uh, oh, the function should not return the array, should not return the, the exam. So uh, the result should be this array if result of length is uh, not zero. Sorry, just parenthesis. It's not zero, and then we can return result the first, the first and only element. Otherwise, uh, we can return undefined. Okay, I didn't write equal to zero because zero is false and not zero is true. Another way of writing this statement, uh, common in the JavaScript world, is also to use the ternary operator, the question mark colon. So I would try to return if results dot length, then result of zero. Otherwise, undefined. It's one one way of writing. Hmm? So, in two lines, basically, when you are. We have all the looping, all the comparison, all the say, mechanism already handled by the filter function. We need the second line uh, because we have to, to consider the special case when the element could be, not be there. Huh? And so we don't need uh, this older code. And again, also the after date function could be written with a filter. But this time, the callback is uh, the is same of after function. So maybe you can write it after date. So I will implement it over taking as a parameter a start date. And now what we are doing if we are using the, this new functional method that we just learned, of course, we create a new exam list as before. But then it's easy to fill the content of this exam, exam list by filtering over the exams of the current exam list. So we can, could immediately result, replace the exam list inside the result that we are building 
by taking the current exam list and filtering it with a condition that uh, uh, give an exam the exam dot date is same or after that date. And then we turn it up. So we are taking the current exam list, filtering, so selecting only the one the ones that satisfy the condition where their data is after the threshold. And we are saving this list directly into the exam list attributes. So we are bypassing uh, in a way the uh, modifying directly the attribute of, of the object. But we are still in the same, it's the same object of our type, so we are not mm, okay, uh, modifying an attribute of another type of object. It's still both a result and these are the same object, same type of object. So even if there were a private property, we could do it. Huh? There is no notion of privacy here, but uh, we are not doing something evil also. And it should work, should work in the same way. So basically, that's how it, it, be, it may be strange to read it the first uh, first time until we get uh, the habit. But then you see that uh, actually it's clearer because it's more explicit. Uh, when you write, when I see a, a for loop with a couple of flags, uh, I never know what 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 happens inside. If I see filter or if I see map, uh, I know what's going to happen, and then I will only focus on what the callback is doing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, I forgot to copy this, this statement. So we start day and not start date. OK, uh, you notice that I already defined a method here, and it doesn't give me any error. Because I called this dot after date and this dot after date with the same name. Uh, it's because we I, here I created a new attribute called after date, and here I redefined the value of that attribute. So it's not uh, like I'm trying to declare with let to different values. So it doesn't create a problem. Of course, normally we don't do that, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, and so only the second one will uh, will remain, of course, because we. The second one will override the first one. Yes? Is there a way to have like an uh, overload of this where uh, you have two functions that No. So uh, the question was whether I can do the overloading of a function. So uh, the, the same name and distinguish different functions with that maybe different number of parameters. The answer is no, because a function is just a name. It's just a reference. So it doesn't bring uh, information about the number of parameters. The overloading. Should if you want to do that, you should do it inside the function. The function can inspect their parameters and decide what to do. Like we saw with the methods of the DJS, if you call it with a parameter, it becomes a setter. If you call it without any parameter, it becomes a getter. But it's a function itself that has this dual behavior. You can, it's not, they, are not, they are not two functions that are called depending on the number of parameters. It's only the, the same function. OK, so this is the new or the common programming style in JavaScript when handling data structures. So the common operation, like having objects in array and computing and transform each one and keep the other, are usually very you know, simple operations with these uh, techniques. And these techniques are also the basis for the next step uh, that we are starting to see now which is the, the complex one. So we took a series of steps, and now we come to the, to the real difficult one, difficult or complex ones. Asynchronous programming, what does it mean? Well, it's, it's a strange uh, name, no? Being uh, uh, talking about asynchronous programming in JavaScript, because you read everywhere that the interpreter of JavaScript is a single thread. 
So there is no real parallel computation. It will never happen that two different instructions in JavaScript will execute really in parallel. Both Node.js and the implementation of, of JavaScript in the browsers are single-threaded. So only one execution, one instruction is executed at a given time. We will see more detail about the execution model in the browser, where everything is synchronous when we study the browser later on. Uh, but the idea is that uh, the, uh, there's no risk uh, of uh, you know race conditions like we saw in the when, like you saw in the operating system courses uh, where you are accessing the same variable uh, uh, at lower level with different instructions that run at the same time. But uh, we have a, a concurrency, a, syn a synchronicity at a higher level. Um, different. We may need or want a function to be called uh, at a different time from the point of code in which we are invoking that function. So I want to say, OK, this function should be called only maybe after one second, after a delay. And we don't want the program to sit in loop uh, and count for the day, delay. We want the program to continue and do something else. We may meet the function. To, we may initiate an input-output uh, uh, operation. So I want to read a file, the content of the file. And reading the file could take time. Or maybe it's even a file on the network. and make a request from an external server. And the result will take maybe 300, 400, 800 milliseconds. It's a long time just to sit and wait. So we launch the request, the input-output request, and say, tell me when you're ready. Tell me when it's done. Call this function when the result is ready. And meanwhile, I will do something else. I don't want to block the program. Imagine, I remember the JavaScript is the, in the user interface. I don't want to block the interface while I'm waiting some data to load. So a lot of operations that involve input output, basically, should be done and must be done asynchronous. So you start the operation, and you forget about that until somebody tells you that the operation is finished. And how do they tell you that the operation is finished? You provide a callback, and they will call you your callback when the operation is over. Uh, the simplest asynchronous operation we can do is with a timeout. The timeout waits for something to happen, and this something will be just a pacing of time, not real uh, operation. Then we'll, we'll, we'll soon see how to use a, a database interface, interacting with a database, which is a, a, an, a an useful and simple example of a synchronous operation. But let's uh, start with the basics. Hmm? Imagine we want to do some computation, some operation, and then in parallel, we want to set some operation to happen in the future. After one second or something like that. So we could uh, use this predefined function, which is called set timeout. Set timeout schedules a function to be called after a given time. OK, so it receives a callback and a time interval. When you call the set time my function, the, your code will execute immediately. Then it will go forward immediately in executing the next instructions. The callback will not be called right now. When you are, when we are using a filter or a map, the callback is called immediately. And only when all the computation is finished, you can go forward with your code. Here, we go forward with the code immediately, and the function will be called later. So let's uh, see some practical example. Let's start a simple file, OK? New file, timeout. Timeout.
So I want to do something very simple. Print two numbers on, on the console. Console.log one and console.log two. But uh, maybe console.log one is the completion of some input output operation. So let's fake it and imagine that it will happen after a, some time. So I start some operation, some input output operation, and then I know that this operation will finish after one second. So I can set, uh, we have these uh, two functions here, set timeout and set interval. The difference. Uh, are that they both call a callback after delay. Timeout will call it once and then forget it. Interval will call it every time, every second or every half a second, every delay that you specify. For example, periodic. Let's do it once. Set timeout is a function that takes a one handler function, the callback, and a number plus any other argument that will be given to the function, but we don't need them right now. So the function, the callback, will, will be the, a function that will write this console log one. So it's a function that doesn't need any argument, but that writes one on the console. One. And then we say it want to happen after 100 milliseconds. So if we run this, let's see if it works. Eh? We see that two is printed before one. Let's go up to one second so it's more visible. Control F5. You see what happened? Let's make it clear. Let's write a zero before. One, zero, two, one. Okay. So what I'm doing is that we have three instructions in this call. And these three instructions are executed right away, one after the other. The first one prints zero, the second does something, and the third one prints two. And they execute immediately. The second one is a sets a timeout. So uh, in with the internal mechanism of Node.js, uh, there will be a timer that after 100 millisec 1000 milliseconds will call this function. I need to provide a function here, okay? And the code of this function is not called now. It will be called when the function is, is executed. Let's be more specific. If I write here not just one, but new date, for example, I'm using for once the And uh, let's do that three times here, okay? The date object will create uh, the current time, no? will be initialized to the current time. Zero. Two. One. Okay. You see also from the timing that uh, zero and two are printed uh, the same time basically and the other one is printed later let's put two seconds so the delay is more visible at the second level okay this means that this function is actually called later on what happens if i write uh, If 
but forget all this and write something like that. So this is a, a mistake, okay? And try to understand what happened here. I forgot to define a function, and they just brought uh, what they want to be executed. In this way, uh, the argument of set timeout, the first argument, would be the result of this console.log. Right? I'm calling this function now at line 9. And the result of this log operation will be probably undefined, or I don't know what log returns. And so the timeout doesn't have a function to execute in the future. So the difference is that the, in this way, I'm executing the function now. In this way, I'm creating a function. I'm executing this instruction now, this expression now, but the result of the expression is a reference to a function. And the function itself is not executed now. It will be executed when the callback will be called. Okay, if I see it here, OK, I, I have an error. In this case, uh, set timeout is kind enough to check the parameters. And it said that the callback must be a function, and instead they received undefined. Undefined is the result of the console.log. But we see that the function, the console.log, has already been called here immediately. Okay, so always try to think about when a given function or piece of a function is executed. When I'm Writing a function call is executed when the call is, is reached. If I define a new function with the arrow syntax, I'm just uh, setting aside the code for that function. And only when the callback will be called, the function will be executed. Maybe never. I just declare the function. I'm not calling it right now. OK? So for the timeout, it's uh, it's clear. But in other cases, we must be sure, okay, that the values are are uh, are computed at the right time. And this can also lead to surprises sometimes. So instead of writing zero, one, or two, we could write a variable x. That x equal to zero. Let x in, let's increment x. Increment x. And every time we log the value of x. So that's become more interesting. What are we printing? I guess that here we are printing zero. Easy enough. And that here we are printing two. Because zero, then I increment, increment, and print. But what, do I, what are we printing here? One or two? Or three? Let's increment one more there. Three. Why is it three? We are using the closure concept here. We are defining a function where x is a reference to a variable in the enclosing context. 
So this x refers to this variable here. It doesn't refer to the value of the variable, the current value of the variable. Here I'm using the current variable, the current value. X is evaluated to zero, right? X is evaluated to two, right? And we are evaluating an expression and using the value right away. Here we are not evaluating this expression because we are not evaluating this code. We are not executing this code. We are just like compiling it and putting it away for later. And as we store the code, we must store also the references to all the objects that this code is using. And in this case, the X would be a reference to the variable x and it will evaluate this expression and so pick the value of x only when this callback is executed when this function will be really called okay and if we want to use the value X when the timeout uh, at this at this point here. Well, maybe this instruction could be for uh, you to actually the value. Well, we must uh, pass the parameter this value. Some way to the function. We must take a snapshot, for example. And this value maybe doesn't change anymore. The one which was the current value at this time, I'm creating a variable that doesn't change anymore. And then I have this closure over this variable that didn't change. But when we see more sophisticated callback, we'll see how to create that inside the function itself. But now it's the environment that will help us to remember a value. Because actually we are not executing any code instead of these braces right now. So we cannot do anything if the environment doesn't help us. I couldn't write this let current x uh, here inside the code, inside the braces, because it will not be executed. The current x will be saved uh, at, the, at the execution time when x when x, x is already three. Okay, so um, in, the, in this debate mechanism, we are using the callback mechanism that, that we saw before. The only difference is that uh, the result of the callback, uh, the, sorry, the, the execution of the callback is delayed until some condition happens. In this case, it's just a timing condition. And uh, also, if this operation can some, do something more, for example, like we can put x to 3, or oh, sorry, to 30 inside the callback. We won't see the result here. But uh, x is still a reference to this variable. And right now we change the variable x to 30. Right now we don't see the result, of course, because the, uh, there's no instruction that will execute after two seconds. But if we had to set another timeout uh, of the same type, after just one second. No, sorry. Uh, it needs to be longer. After four seconds, it would probably see 30. We have two different functions that are called independently from each other asynchronously. That's where it comes from. 
and they are both sharing the same variable. They are just closing on the same variables, and they each of them says the sees and uses and modifies the latest. The variable is only one, so there's only one value. The order of execution of the operations doesn't match the order of the code. This is what makes this code, this kind of code, hard to write. Yeah? So uh, when I have uh, two elements like this, but uh, maybe they are not the same elements, so maybe like uh, two seconds and two seconds. Who wins? You're asking. The last one. I don't know. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, if uh, some way to try to prove There are, there are, no. <laughs> uh, it, it may happen. So right now I, I've been very, very careful no, no, to, to take the different uh, call to call the different callbacks at different times and of course it may happen that different events happen more or less simultaneously and uh, there is no see this is asynchronous so we we don't know really which one wins in this case we have two in this case probably the second one is executing after because we see the 30 so it, it's approved the first one was executed before but we have a and this is more consistent because we have such a simple program and the different callbacks are being queued that set the timeout uh, manages a five for queue uh, a priority queue basically um, tagged by, by by the expected time. Okay, so if you line the priority queue will is just is a say, monotonical increasing. But in general, we we don't know. We we must program these callbacks uh, to do the right thing, whatever the order they are called in. Because right now, okay, so it's two thousand. But if this were two different queries on the database. Or two different requests from a remote website for uh, some JSON information. Which are wise first? I can never know. It depends uh, on the execution speed of something else. It depends on the network speed. So really, when I think that something is asynchronous, I must deal with it as really asynchronous. Sooner or later, maybe it will, it will execute. I cannot make any assumption over, over the order at which asynchronous operation happen because they are asynchronous. Okay, so my code should take that into account. And it may happen, and you see it with, uh, with examples, uh, um, that in some cases, uh, if we don't, if we are not careful with this asynchronous code, the wrong result may happen. The wrong result, the computation may be wrong at the end. Because we expect a value to be there and instead it's not there. Or may not be there yet, depends on depending on the speed of something else. Yes. Sorry, uh, maybe it's some time and extreme case, but uh, if uh, we have uh, a function that is very long uh, inside uh, the set timeout uh, and the time uh, is not enough to build uh, this function. Uh, the timeout uh, uh, die uh, before uh, the function yeah. is created, what happens? Yeah. So the question was, what happens if I have a, a running function that goes very long and the timeout expires? Uh, no? Maybe it's might be short, uh, what, just uh, 20, 10 milliseconds, and the function does some computation, it takes longer than 10 milliseconds. In this case, uh, the timeout waits. Because JavaScript never interrupts a function running. The JavaScript will uh, check the asynchronous events only when the function, well, all functions are stopped in a way. We don't see it here because we are in Node.js and we are over the only asynchronous code right now. In the browser, uh, you can imagine that when you're opening a, a, a web page in the browser, we have a lot of JavaScript that beats the page, and then all the JavaScript has nothing to do suddenly until you click on something, until you move your mouse and something like that. And so all the functions are stopped, they don't need to do anything, and some asynchronous events happen and they, they run. If there is a, a, lot, a lot of activity, 
all these asynchronous events are queued line, line up. There's, there's an event queue into the JavaScript engine. And so the events, the asynchronous events are processed when there is no synchronous code to run. It's more complex than that. Because they're more, but we'll see that when we analyze the browser. But um, these asynchronous uh, computation model in JavaScript is a non preemptive model. So no function is ever interrupted by another asynchronous function. Your function will run to the end, and then JavaScript node will check whether there's an, uh, some asynchronous event to run, and it will execute them. And we will learn that. We will learn to be quick when we execute callbacks. We want the callbacks to exit fast so that other callbacks, other events, will be processed. And if we do some longer computation, we put it at, in an asynchronous call. So that we are not blocking any part of the interface for doing some computation. It will be done asynchronously. And then we will continue when the result is ready. Hmm? So that uh, what the, the consequence of that. Okay, so there is it's uh, it's not uh, dangerous programming because it's not uh, what I said before, there's no real concurrency. So there's still separate. Either the JavaScript is executing one function or another one. What we don't know is the order and the time when they are executing the function. And uh, the closure mechanism makes it uh, somewhat dangerous because different functions are using the same variables without, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe I have, uh, I'm not sure if I write 2000 and then 1 1999, has it happened before? Yes, in this case, yes. But this is a very, very simple case. Mm -hmm. um, this means that uh, all our code, let's say, should be non-blocking, should be execute something, and all long operation uh, should be set uh, um, into an asynchronous handler, all input-output operations and so on. And basically, the reason why, for example, we are not uh, use console.log to print something, but if you notice no exercise, in no exercise we, we read some data from the input, from the keyboard. Because even reading data from the keyboard should be an asynchronous operation. But there are no blocking operations, basically, like an input uh, uh, or scanf uh, in JavaScript. It's out of the, of the logic of the language to have in blocking operations. So even for reading something, we will need to do it uh, with an asynchronous callback, and we, could, <laughs> we couldn't do it uh, until today, basically. Hmm? Um, this is an example, in fact, of how you, could, you should uh, uh, get data from the console. If you want to read some data from the console, uh, you make this uh, uh, read line um, library. It's not, uh, we will not use it, so let's not waste too much time on that. But the idea is that if I want to read something from the console with, a, with some library, I print the question and wait for the answer. So this is the pattern. I want to ask a question and let the user uh, reply on the console. OK, I have this method, the readline.question, that prints the question and doesn't wait for the response to be typed by the user. It will just set a callback that will be called when the user, in their own time, will type the, the, the response. And uh, this callback will have a parameter, as a parameter, the string uh, typed by the user. And then this callback will save this answer into a variable. And then we'll close the console and whatever. So the uh, the good part is that uh, uh, after se uh, calling this uh, question, our code down here may continue, may do something else, some other useful uh, useful stuff. The bad part is that the code right here doesn't have the current value, the right value for this description. Because even if it seems that on this line the description variable is assigned, when I execute this code down here, I still don't have executed 
this callback. And so, I, like in our example, I have x equal to 30 here, but this value is not valid on line 15. Okay, will be valid some po at some point in the future. So even if we see some assignment here, we know that we are reading some value on the next line. Um, you can just imagine that every variable that you are setting into a callback is a variable that you are destroying in some way. So you should not be rely on it after setting it because it will change probably sometimes. So it's better to forget about that, about that variable. You can do everything you want before setting the asynchronous call, but when you are setting a asynchronous call, that will change <coughs> some variable in the lines after that. Uh, forget about that, because you will never be sure of what it contains. Um, OK, this is what the simple timers. Uh, there is a problem we are not uh, just only mentioned here, but we go, don't want to go into detail because there will be a more general solution later on with the promises, which is a, a way of handling this uh, in a more structured way. Um, I said that uh, asynchronous operations are mostly useful for uh, input output code, input output operation. And input output operations are two, ta two things in common one, they're slow, and second, they are unpredictable so there may be errors huh? the connection may be down the file may not exist or whatever and so if we are delaying some operation what happens if the operation is wrong maybe my code my function that asked for the operation is no longer active the program is doing something totally different right now and only then I discover that the connection is lost and the timeout uh, that we have a, a, time, a connection timeout uh, not the timeout that I said, but uh, the TCP IP connection drops uh, because uh, the server is not responding. And so, how can I handle an asynchronous operation that may fail? Uh, there are different possibilities. There are no rule, okay? There's no constant in the language for doing that. One possibility is to exploit uh, the callback function itself uh, by passing a parameter that contains some error information. So several library functions use this pattern. Uh, I always think it's confusing. Um, read file, for example, is a... Uh, uh, Function for reading a file, like the name says, from the file system library module, and trying to read the content of this file. So I'm launching the operation, and I'm saying, okay, when the operation is over, call this function. And this function will uh, receive the data extracted from the file, and okay, we'll print it on screen or whatever. This is the normal operation. If something goes wrong, the read file procedure somewhere that is running asynchronously will call this um, uh, callback anyway with an error code as the first parameter. So the idea is that this callback has two parameters. The first one is the error code and the second is the data. If the first one is null, then there were no errors and the data is valid. If the first one is not null, then it will contain some error information, like a string, a message, or another object, and the data is not valid. Okay. And I my callback is called with this information. And so at this point I say, okay, if I'm being called with the, some error information, then I okay, I must handle the error. Otherwise, I can process and store the data. This is one possibility. 
having the callback being given the information of what went good or what went wrong. And the callback itself, which is the only thing that still survives of my code when the, the operation is completed, must handle the error in some way. Okay. In other cases, we have uh, two different callbacks, one to call in the case of uh, success and the other to be called in the case of failure. It depends on the library documentation. It depends on the module, the function that you are calling that will execute asynchronously uh, and we tell you, okay, you will get these results uh, with this callback uh, and you will get maybe an, uh, the error as the first parameter of the callback or as another callback. So you will define two different functions, one for handling uh, normal case and the other for handling the bad case. As I said, there is no standard, so we need to check the documentation of every uh, library. And so for the, do making some more useful examples of asynchronous code, not just timeouts, because they are a bit uh, uh, artificial, uh, we can use one library that would be useful also in the future uh, of uh, database access. Uh, no, we don't want to make it a complex architecture by adding a database server or whatever, and so we are using the uh, SQLite uh, uh, library. I don't know if you already knew about SQLite, uh, it's a sort of an in-process database. So normally with a database you have uh, your program and you have a database running on your computer or in some other server and you connect to the database to run the queries and so on. So you are not in control of the data. The DDBMS is running that, and uh, you just connect and send the queries and so on. SQLite is a very shrink down database that runs inside your program. So with SQLite, you are, it's a SQLite, it's a, it's a relational database engine that runs as a library in your own program and stores all your tables uh, in, a, in a file. So it's very small, it's standard, for example, in Android for storing the application of the different apps that need to have a local storage. And uh, uh, so you just open a file and tell the SQLite library, okay, this, this is my database. And, and then you do the create table and select uh, and the insert ta into table and whatever instruction uh, to the library. And it will insert the data into that single file. You don't need uh, to have a separate process, of course, uh, that file should be property of that process. It's not a file that allows concurrent access. It's not a, a database server that other processes can access. It's a private, small database inside my process. It's very simple to, to, to deploy, basically. Huh? It has a lot of limitations, but uh, uh, the big advantage is very, it's very simple. And uh, SQLite is a library written in C, not just in, that, in a native library, that has uh, one or more JavaScript uh, uh, binding wrappers where you, can, where you can access the SQLite functions in, in, in JavaScript. And uh, uh, for example, the official module for SQLite, the official NPM module for SQLite is called uh, SQLite 3. And so you can, we can install into our project the SQLite 3 library and inside our uh, programs we can use them. So we now we don't have a lot of time to do example, but we'll just I just want to, to share with you the the pattern of programming with SQLite. So for example, okay, the first instruction here is uh, require the library, import in the library, nothing special. Then we need to create an object, DB, that will be used to do all the queries, a reference to the database itself. And this uh, like opening a file. I'm opening the connection, not to a remote server, but to my local file. And by itself, it is an asynchronous operation. The file may not exist, it may not be in the right format, may be locked, but whatever. And so the call is here is a constructor function, new database. SQLite is the name of the module. Database is a function is a constructor function defined in the module. So we call this to create the new DB object uh, that will be used to do all the queries. 
But this uh, constructor function is an asynchronous function. Does some asynchronous operations. So I, I'm giving the function the parameters, what to do, what file I want to open, and a callback to call me if something goes wrong. And it's a callback. It's not an error code. I don't have an error code here as a result, because the error will be will come later. DB is a reference to some connection that will be available in the future. It is not maybe it's not available immediately in the in the next operation. Hmm? So it's a bit strange. I'm opening the connection, it may be open or not, I will know it later. And when I'm doing uh, uh, queries, for example, and uh, I just comment on the syntax of this one, db.all, so db is the database object that we opened, and we hoped uh, the, the error callback wasn't called. Otherwise, we would have stopped this operation. But if the database is open correctly, uh, all uh, is the method that on this database returns all the results of a query. So you make a selector, the selector is 100 results, and they will, it will return me an array with 100 elements. Okay? But the details are for later. What is the signature of this method? First, I get the first parameter is the query. Select uh, asterisk from uh, users. The second is an array of parameters. Maybe this query has some variables inside. So I want to pass some values inside the query itself. Okay. So the first two parameters define what is the query that they want to run. The statement and the arguments of this statement. And then we have the callback, where R is an error code, and rows is an array that contains the result. So the actual result will not be available in the line of code after this debit of at all. The, only, the result will only be available inside these square braces that will be executed when the query finishes, only if R is none, is, is null. There were no error, so the rows contains the result. Yes. No. Yeah. If you pass the parameters here, yes. If you, but we'll we'll see it uh, next week, of course. Okay. So I'm in practice. What I wanted to share right now was the the, the, the programming pattern. So, if I want to make a query and do some operation after the result of that query, with the result of that query, where should I do that? Only here. If I want to print the result as, as 10 lines, for example, I should print it here. If I want to store the results in some array that I need in my program, I should store it here. And even if this array is defined in the surrounding function, will not be available right now. Remember, every variable that we touch here is dead. And we need to do a second query with the result of the first one. So imagine we get a first query with the IDs, and then you need to do a second query with, uh, for getting the details of these IDs, or the result of the first one. OK, then you can execute. Uh, the second query is only inside the callback of the first one. So in order to have the operations in sequence, one after the other, we must execute the next operation inside the callback of the first one, and the third operation inside the callback of the second one, which is inside the callback of the first one. So the order of execution operation is the order of nesting of callback inside callback inside callback. It's called callback hell in JavaScript speaking. Huh? Because we have a, a sequence of nested callbacks, and one uh, it 
the execution of one callback will start another asynchronous operation whose completion we call the second callback that will fire another operation and so on. So everything will be inside braces, inside parentheses of the real code, and the order of execution of this code is totally screwed, uh, sorry for the word, uh, comparing to the, to, the, um, to the writing of the code itself. What we'll do is to try to get familiar with this uh, programming method, and SQLite is good as a library because it's very simple, and but it's very raw. And then we'll see some more simplified method for dealing with that, since this is basic, this level of programming leads to a lot of programming errors or difficulties in understanding the code. The designer of JavaScript in, in more recent language, in the more iteration of the language, defined a new class which is called Promise, which is a class that simplifies a lot uh, the handling of this kind of mechanism. But first, we need, we need to understand the mechanism, then how to rob the mechanism into promises, and then there will be a couple of constructs that are called await and async that uh, will handle that at the, at the level of syntax. And so we will, let, we will be able to write code that looks like sequential, even if it's, if it's total asynchronous. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, 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 a lot of blocks to build also for the next Monday. Thank you. Uh, remember, if you didn't fill the form to do it uh, right now, before lunch, uh, uh, or during lunch or whatever, so that um, tomorrow we can give you the schedule and uh, on Thursday we can, you can have the first lab. Thank you for everything.